Welcome listeners to a brand new episode of Oh My Word, bonus episode of Oh My Word podcast. Amazing special treat we have today is we've got an agent, yes, one of those weird unicorns, we've captured him and we have him for an interview today. Everyone, Alex Shane from The Writer's House. Alec, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. I appreciate you having me. I feel like um, for writers, agents are like the, oh, you know, the angelic with the uh, halo and, uh, <laughs> you know, aura kind of situation. So it's, I, we're so glad that you're here. Yeah, it's funny. I, I personally, I never quite understood why why authors hold agents in such high regard when it should be the exact opposite. Um, you know, if authors stopped writing, agents would be unemployed immediately. But if agents disappeared, writers would still keep on writing. So it should be the, the halo should be on the writer's head, not our head. So hopefully, I can debunk that myth during today's interview. You know what? I almost feel like we could just cut it right there, and that's <laughs> turn that into <laughs> like a magnet, and we're done. <laughs> All right. So, how did you get into agenting? Why did why you're like, you know what, I'm going to be an agent. Like, why would you decide that? <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, and I did, honestly. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it as short as possible. Basically, I moved to New York uh, in June of 2008 uh, after a short and unsuccessful but very fun career in the stunt industry uh, in Los Angeles, what? doing a lot of really bad straight-to-DVD action movies, uh, you know, where the good guy beat up like seven dudes at once. I played like dude number three or dude number four, <laughs> a couple of bargain bin bad action movies. Um, but stunt work is not a very long career because you're getting beat up for a living. You can't do it forever. And I've always been an East Coast kid, lived in Connecticut my whole life. And I, I moved to New York, not because I was really excited about it, but I had nothing else to do, and I thought, you know, I'll give finance a try. I hear they make good money. But June 2008 was also literally the month when the bubble burst, the economy collapsed, and everything kind of went to pot in the finance industry. Yeah. So so any job that – any any hedge fund or investment firm, whatever, that survived the, the bubble bursting wasn't hiring. Uh, the very few that were hiring were not looking for a 27-year-old stuntman. So <laughs> I was like, well, I guess finance is out. Uh, what do you like to do, Alec? you got to find a job. New York's not a cheap place to live. Uh, I'm a huge sports fan. There's a lot of sports teams in New York, NFL offices is in New York. Uh, I like to read. Uh, I knew books was a job in some capacity. I knew they were written by authors and put on shelves by bookstore employees. Something had to have happened between that those two things uh, on the book end of the, t of the spectrum. So I literally just Googled the word book jobs one day and started kind of navigating the weird internet maze of finding people who worked in the industry and making cold calls and emails and all that junk and ended up literally cold calling writer's house. And I basically just spoke to the, the Michael Mejias who kind of runs the internship program there. And I sweet talked my way into, I believe, a informational interview, they call it. And I uh, was able to get an internship uh, that fall. And uh, I was luckily in that right place, right time. Jody Reamer, who's a very successful agent, represents Twilight, represents John Green, Ryan some rigs, a lot of very successful YA titles, was looking for an assistant as I was finishing my program up. And so I started working for her in 2009. And the rest, as they say, is history. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, when I hear of cold calling these days, I think of the person on the other end of the phone saying, oh, thank you for your interest. But no, you know, that. Yeah. I mean, it is not that far. Basically, I, I called uh, Michael and I was like, hey, listen, you don't know me. I'm looking to get into publishing. Are you hiring? This is in 2008, so it wasn't as maybe weird as it is today versus yeah. with text messages and DMs. But he laughed, uh, but he, I guess, admired my moxie. And he's also a Yankees fan, a Red Sox fan. We kind of bonded over the rivalry a little bit. and We kind of hit it off. And so um, I got very lucky in that respect. But, yeah, I mean, it's not something I don't know if it really works today, cold calls, but – you, you miss all the shots you don't take, as Wayne Gretzky used to say. Right. I have to ask something about the stuntman thing. How do you how do you fall into something like that? Like, oh, I can take a punch, or like I could get I could get thrown around, or I'm good at gymnastics, or I'm good at I don't know. Like, what? 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 what why would Sony like? How do you even do that? <laughs> yeah, a good question. I had been uh, training in martial arts since I was about six years old, uh, and so that's kind of where it came from. The thought process. Well, I actually went to school to be a teacher. Uh, and I still might be a teacher. I think it's a cool retirement job. Teach creative writing at some prep school somewhere or some school off in the Midwest. Just kind of <laughs> so busy. Um, but I did my student teaching in Central Falls, Rhode Island, which is a lower economic status area in Providence, primarily a Guatemalan and Puerto Rican population. Uh, and I absolutely love the kids. I love the environment. But when you're immigrating to America at age 12 or 13 or so, not speaking any English at all, right. uh, sometimes you're held back a year or two as you acclimate, learn the language, get accustomed to the society, whatever the case may be. And um, I was 23 
teaching 19 and 20 year old kids. Um, and when you're 23 and your students are 20, yeah. like it's not no one's fault, but there just isn't like an age gap that re required for a teacher and a student. Right. Um, they were they got along. They were very respectful. They were wonderful kids. But again, they just didn't see me as a teacher through nobody's fault. So it's like, all right, well, teaching's fun. I enjoy it. I like these kids. I like the environment. I got to get a little older. Uh, 27 or 28 is ancient to a 20 year old. So yeah. I can go back at like 27. Uh, I, I know I know martial arts. I've been doing that for a long time. I, got, I had a couple friends in L.A. I'll move out there. If I become the next Jackie Chan, awesome. Uh, <laughs> if I don't, no big deal. I'll come back and start teaching, which was initially the intention uh, at some point, but I just fell into publishing it and loved it so much. I haven't really thought about it since. Wow. Did you grow up as a big reader or were you always reading just sports stats or, or was that what Brooks always part of your life? It was just like, oh yeah, I also like that also. Yeah, no, I was always a big reader. My mother uh, always, always had a Stephen King book in her hands. Hmm. Uh, and one of my more enjoyable childhood memories was I come up from school, like first grade, kindergarten, whatever, and she'd make me a snack, and she'd kind of tell me what was happening in the book she was reading. She'd obviously kind of PGify it for, for kids. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, left out the gory parts. Like, I fell in love with kind of horror stories and Stephen King. Just listening to my mom kind of give book reports on the book that she was reading. And I read through all the Goosebumps books and all the Three Investigators and the Choose Your Own Adventure books. And uh, I've been reading for, for a very, very long time. Uh, sports stats, of course, as well. But, uh, you know, my mom and I always bonded over books. And so, so she's definitely the one uh, I'm, I'm blaming for my, my career choice. <laughs> Yeah, because also becoming an agent, I'm thinking like for a lot of people, when you tell them, oh, I'm going to be a writer or I am a writer, they kind of give you the look of like, you know, when are you going to get a real job? So do you get that as an agent? Because it's so commission based, right? I, I think it's all commission based, right? So do you kind of get that look of, oh, are you ever going to get a real job or people don't see agents in that same kind of way? Yeah, it's funny. People don't really know what agents do uh, in publishing. Everyone knows oh. about their Hollywood <laughs> agent or their sports agent. But right. if you hear like literary agent, no one's like, oh, I know what that is. Right. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 I mean, I think there are a lot of sales jobs that are commission only. Uh, and I like the fact that you reap what you sow, you know, you, you, yeah. you get out what you put in. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, there's a nice kind of freedom to that. Obviously, there's a lot of pressure in that because if you don't sell anything, you don't make any money. Right. But, um, you know, I, I think it's not for everybody in neither a good way nor a bad way. There's a certain kind of personality type that, that, that thrives more in that environment. And it's difficult because obviously publishing is constantly changing and shifting as the world changes and shifts. So yeah. uh, to be constantly keeping up with it as well as needing to to kind of keep uh, yourself fed is a really interesting balancing act to, to, to perform for sure. Wow. Someone, um, someone once said that like an, an agent, if you're going to have, I don't know, I guess like I don't know, steady income or if you're a success, uh, successful agent, you need to have at least like a few dozen writers who are, who are writing to be able to, I guess, get to that point. Is that... I mean, if you don't have your one big writer, is that is that so that you've got to have like a bunch, a bunch of writers? That Good you're question. Writing? I mean, it really depends. You know, I mean, obviously the you know some some agents only need one author. You know, some yeah, authors right. are big enough to they, they make so much money that you're you're good to go with your kind of flagship authors. Yeah. yeah for the most part, the vast majority of authors, you know, they have a job that isn't writing. You know, it's a nice way to supplement their income. Yeah. They get the occasional royalty check. But, you know, they're not making a living writing full time. Uh, some, some authors are, and that's wonderful. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, you, you definitely need a, a robust list of, of clients who are writing regularly and receiving royalties and writing a book a year because, you know, you know agents don't get paid until authors get paid, uh, which is why it's always great to do podcasts like this and do conferences and conventions or whatever the case may be because I am always looking to expand my list and, and, and hire new, new authors, you know, because I think there's a really interesting stigma about how, like, Authors get so nervous when they pitch agents or meeting agents as if you don't pay me money and I don't want to read your book and sell it for a lot of money because that's right. in everyone's best interest. So right. um, if anything, the agent should be worried about the author saying no to them because you have all the you have all the control in that respect. And, um, you know, the financial part of it is just a kind of a small aspect of, of the agent author relationship. And it is, it's one that's kind of hard to avoid. Right. Just a, a side thing. Did you never think of becoming a writer yourself? You were just like, no, I'm going to pitch the writers. You didn't. Did you ever think that you were going to write something or that was never? So I guess, uh, I, guess I, I use this word very loosely, but I moonlight as a, as a sports writer. Uh, ah, okay. I cover uh, I cover the New England Patriots for SB Nation. Uh, I, I, I do a podcast and I, I write a lot of articles covering various aspects of the NFL and Patriots football. Uh, I have a bunch of ideas for, 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 for a book that I think might, might sell, but the problem with uh, being a, uh, an agent and also uh, a writer and a reader. This is just me personally. I can't speak for anybody else. But uh, if I'm just in and around the book world all day from 8 in the morning till 7, 8 at night and I clock out, 
I don't always feel like reading or writing for another two or three hours. Yeah. You know, I just kind of want to zone out and watch a really crappy movie or something. <laughs> so it's hard to find that balance between, you know, being immersed in, in writing and reading all day and also writing and reading for pleasure. It's very important to do right. for market research and to kind of refresh your brain and reset your battery a bit to kind of read a book just to the hell of it. But uh, it is one of the challenges of, of my job when you kind of do what you love for a living to separate doing it because you enjoy it and doing it because you have to do it. Right. Well, how do you how do you keep track of of the market when there's always so much out there? How much of it do you actually have to read versus just kind of know about? I don't know if there's like a real percentage number for that, but how do you keep tabs on th- something like that? Yeah, it's tough because publishing is interesting, and in you know the books that are selling right now on, on on shelves that are really hot right now, things that are trending in publishing, all are over in terms of the business side of it, right? Because right. the books that are coming out right now. They first sold to publishers 18 months ago, right. two years ago, maybe. Right. There's such a long lead time uh, for, for books and publishing. So you really can't ever, for a writer or an agent or whatever, you can't go to a bookstore, see what's popular, and then write to that. Because that trend is already long gone at that point. Um, so it's really all about kind of keeping it to the ground on various deals that are made. Just doing networking. You know, Before the pandemic, it was, I would do a lot of you know drinks meetings or lunch meetings or various networking events with editors where you get to know each other and you hear about who's looking for what, what people are looking to fill in their their lists just kind of keeping your ear to the ground of the industry as a whole uh publishers marketplace various deals are being announced etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and just knowing what 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 agents and, and editors are, are selling elsewhere in the industry uh, at the same time though a lot of this is kind of gut feeling manuscripts you really like a book you're excited to work on things yeah. you really feel has potential you know because again agents work for free until a book sells and Usually there are several months, if not longer, of back and forth editing and revising and tweaking with the author before you submit to the editor. And even then it may not even sell. So if you think about whatever you do for your own work, you know, if you're not going to get paid anything for six months and you still might not get paid at the end of those six months, how much do you have to love what you're doing during that six month period to really continue doing it? Yeah. And having that kind of passion really translates, I personally find, into, into sales down the line. Well. Wow. How often is it, or okay, I don't know if there's a rule for this, that you'll pick up a writer and you might not sell anything of theirs till a few years later, even? Because whatever first attract you to the work, if it's not fitting the market then, or doesn't have the right agent, does that happen often or not necessarily? Yep. Uh, I currently have an author. Uh, we are revising her fourth manuscript. Wow. But, uh, I'm over wow. for three on her first three. Uh, wow. We're hoping the fourth one's going to hit. Uh, I always say all we're doing with these books that, that don't hit right away is we're just backloading uh, their front loading future work, you know, yeah. you know, not every, the, the, I don't know very many authors at all, actually, where the first book they ever write is the book that sells and gets them and breaks them out. Right. Uh, you see authors all the time, once they're established and they're doing well, they publish books they wrote 15 years ago that they couldn't sell at the time, you know, right. so it's never a bad thing to just keep writing, keep plugging away. I know some agents, I can't speak for anybody besides myself, obviously, you kind of have one shot and you're done, but the vast majority of agents I know, especially in the fiction space, uh, will continue to help you build your career and know when it's time to put a book aside and work on something else. Nonfiction is kind of a different beast, which I'm happy to talk about if you'd like, but uh, in fiction especially, you really want to kind of build your author's career and get to the point where they're just churning books out one a year. That's really everybody's goal. The dream author, the dream agent, one book a year, always does well, steadily growing audience, like a well-oiled machine. Yeah, it sounds beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so did, if you're a writer, do you have to sit and kind of uh, prod your writer sometimes if you feel like they haven't uh, turned up with an idea yet? Like, Come on, where's your book for this year? Or most of the writers, they're coming in and they know that this is a job. They got to make it happen. Yeah, good question. Especially now, it's very difficult because I know that the work-life balance has shifted dramatically yeah. over the course of the year with the pandemic. And a lot of writers have kids. They have to worry about schooling and all that good stuff. Um, so when authors, I don't hear from them for a while, I'll never kind of say, hey, where the hell's my manuscript? Yeah. Just kind of check in, ask how things are going. If they have any ideas they want to bounce around, I'm always happy to kind of, you know, if they, sometimes they'll come to me with, here are three things I'm kind of kicking around in my head. Which one sounds the most interesting or most saleable to you? Mm-hmm. Uh, it really depends on the author themselves. Sometimes authors, they're just prolific idea machines. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have authors have the exact opposite problem with, you know, like publishing is a very slow industry. Yeah. Like I said, if I were to sell your book tomorrow, it's not coming out at this point until probably late, maybe mid-2022 at this point, maybe even later. Yeah. Um, some authors can write 10 books in that time span. Yeah. And what do you do with them, right? And so sometimes authors are too prolific, some are prolific enough. It's really all that balancing act and all about kind of finding the right fit. This is kind of goes back to talking about the list that you have. Is there, you, you usually have like your core and then there's a big, you have kind of a changeover of like authors who kind of fall off that they 
either they stop writing or like they're not producing anymore and the new writers are bringing in or do you just have to keep growing your list, growing your list and you could end up with just, you know, 50 authors or however many you're, you're representing? Yeah, I have authors on my list who I haven't really talked to in a while. Um, we, we still touch base, but, you know, it's not like we're he's, he or she are active in, in their their activity. I have some authors that I'm checking in with all the time. Uh, it's weird. Sometimes it's kind of like you kind of just ghost each other uh, in, not, in not a negative way at all. It's just you just kind of lose touch. And once in a while, they'll come out of the door and say, hey, all goes well. I'm still working on something. And again, it really depends on the actual author's relationship with the writing. Some yeah. writers are doing it because it's almost like a hobby. They enjoy it. If they make some money off of it, great. You know, they, 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 they publish a book once every four or five years, and that's perfectly fine for them. Some authors are really trying to make a go of it as a career. And, you know, how invested they are mirrors how invested I am. And, it, you know, it really is all about that, that agent-author dynamic in a way that, that everyone's happy with. So uh, it's kind of all over the place in that respect. Right. And outside of, of being in charge, well, I guess so there's two – Big thing is that a when they give you the manuscript, you got to go back and forth with them with the editing aspect, and then and then you got to go and pitch it to an agent, and you have to deal the way I guess the way writers see agents is how agents see editors. Is that kind of kind of like that? Yeah, so, no, absolutely. You know, I feel like it's kind of thing where where age, authors are, are looking around trying to find the right agent for them, uh, and they get a lot of rejections from agents, and they find one that works. Uh, agents uh, spend a lot of time looking for the right editor for their author, and they get a lot of rejections from editors, and then eventually they find one that works. You know, it's you know, it's it's a it's a very interesting business. Like everybody is just constantly getting rejected all <laughs> the time in this business. You know, authors get turned down by agents, who get turned down by editors, who get turned down by their boss editors, who get turned down by their sales department, who get turned down by like the president of the company. Like, there's always somebody one level up who will kibosh a book deal. And all the stars kind of have to align for everybody, and which is why it's so wonderful when it happens. Yeah, it's, it sounds like why would anybody get into this industry? Yeah. No, I mean, again, like I think any kind of creative industry, you got to be a little nuts to do this. You yeah. have to really love it. You know, I mean, you have to. What, one thing I really appreciate about publishing is that like everybody who's in it really genuinely enjoys this business and this industry because if you don't love it, like, you know, it's not one of those crappy jobs you keep because the money's really good right? or the yeah. benefits are so, you know, it's a job you do because you really, really enjoy it. And there's a very high ceiling. Right? There's always the chance that you could be the one that, that, that takes off and becomes a mega overnight success. So there's right. always that possibility and that hope. And it's also, it's a good community of people in general. Writers are good people for the most part. Yeah, I, I think almost every writer I've spoken to so far, I'm like, you are good people. How come everyone doesn't know about you? <laughs> yeah. Well, so outside of um, the actual book, uh, pitching, editing, and things like that, do you also sort of act as, how do I don't say, a career manager? Do you all, Are you also responsible for helping to book events and things like that, or authors got to find that on their own? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm finding it. I, I've been in this industry in some capacity, like I said, as an intern from 2008 to, to right now, and just the role of the agent has just shifted so significantly. I feel like the role of everybody in publishing has shifted so significantly. And one of the, the harshest surprises that authors learn when they kind of get into the process and have a book deal with a major publisher in place is they are really going to be on the hook for a lot of their own marketing and publicity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the era of the, the 50 city book tour is a thing of the past, unless your last name is, you know, Grisham or, right. or Rowling or something like that. You know, you're, right. you're doing a lot of your own marketing, you're doing a lot of your own PR, you're hustling your own. And obviously my job as an agent is to help you with that and to guide you with that and, and, and give you advice on how to best maximize your time. Right. You know, you don't want to waste your time collecting Twitter followers because those don't really translate. So there are things you can be doing, but obviously the publisher isn't, isn't useless. They definitely help you book you interviews and they get your reviews and distribution. I'm not saying the publisher can't help you at all, but I always make sure I reiterate the onus of marketing, PR, publicity, pushing your book falls more and more on the author and the agent as the industry continues to, to evolve. Only because you mentioned on the Twitter followers, a lot of people, we always, especially with the writers where I was talking about, oh, you have to have, you have to be on social media, you have to build your platform, all that kind of stuff. But if you're saying that the Twitter followers don't really translate, so I guess this is for you specifically, do you, do you care if they're on social media or does that just show engagement no matter how many people, you know, they have following them? Or is that something more important for nonfiction people to have what looks like a platform? Yeah, it's extremely important for nonfiction. Uh, you have to have a platform. The vast majority of nonfiction that sells is platform based, particularly if it's kind of prescriptive nonfiction. You know, if you're writing a book about infectious disease, for example, like are you a doctor or a biologist? You have to have like, why should I listen to you? Yeah. And here's why. But for 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 fiction, you know, it's, it's nice to have a lot of social media followers. You know, but 
it's not really necessary. It's good to have the community, people that are supportive, they're going to buy your book. But, you know, it's a much less important thing than, than for, for nonfiction. It's more just a matter of being out there, connecting with other writers. You know, you're much more likely, just in general, you're more likely to support somebody you know and you like, right? Yeah. You're going to buy their, their book if you, you interact with them on a personal basis. It's kind of personal connection. So I always in, in, engage authors in fostering those relationships via email newsletters or direct contact or writers groups or whatever the case may be so you can actually know each other beyond that first name basis, build that community so you have friends, you know. Yeah. If you have 10,000 Twitter followers and they all love you and they think you're fantastic and they're going to buy your book, that's very different than just kind of collecting 10,000 Twitter followers, eight tenths of whom you don't even know. So it's kind of a, a very different respect there. Yeah. I, I started looking at engagement with social media platforms because sometimes someone can have thousands of followers and you see like four people like one of their tweets or something. So I'm like, right. so as a general, you know, on a general basis, what does a, a, a general day look like for you as an agent? What is kind of a, 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 a nor if there is such a thing as a normal schedule, what does that kind of look like? Yeah. So it, it used to be, I used to basically spend my commute to and from the office, um, reading new submissions, reading manuscripts, um, various elements of submissions. That was kind of my time. I dedicated every single day, no matter what, to new authors in some capacity. That's gone now, so I lost my commute. So uh, my day is kind of shifted. I usually, I'll wake up, and while I'm having my coffee, I will I will catch up on the 40 or so emails that came into my inbox overnight from international publishers, or I have some clients in Australia, and people that aren't on the kind of Eastern Standard Time. Right. Uh, and I'll kind of organize my day that way. There isn't really a – that's not the only thing I, I do every single morning. My, my days are very different. So some days I have to really crash read uh, and edit a, a manuscript you're going to go on submission with to an editor. Uh, sometimes there's some permissions I have to deal with. Um, sometimes I'm working on finalizing and negotiating a contract with a publisher. So every, every day is very different uh, in that respect. And what's really hard for me now I'm finding is I'm finding a much a harder time um, – breaking down kind of the, 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 the headspace necessary to really delve into a new manuscript and, and give it the time and attention and respect it deserves. And I don't really have little pockets of time carved out of my day automatically anymore. Right. You know, I don't wait, I don't, I'm not waiting in line for my burger at lunchtime right. you know, so I can read, I can read books. So uh, it's really been about trying to find that balance um, and, and put on pants. I don't put on pants <laughs> most days now. Uh, and I found it's amazing how much more productive I get when I'm wearing pants. So I think I'm wearing pants a lot more often now. I probably shouldn't say that on this podcast, not professionally, but I'll let you behind the curtain a little bit. Yeah. Well, that's working from home. I learned that you have to get dressed to say it's going to be a day today. You know, you like, do. yeah, that's well, if you're also, if you're reading a manuscript, uh, uh, you know, waiting along for your burger on the commute, so are you a speed reader? Do you have to be a speed reader? Or you just kind of know, you kind of get a feel for something right away of like, I don't know if I'm going to like this story, but I can see it's good writing um, or, or what. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's also kind of very, some things you can tell right away. Uh, the writing is just not there or this plot doesn't sound like something I'm very interested in. It's not really my cup of tea, not my wheelhouse. Sometimes you can know right away. Uh, sometimes you read to the end and you're not really sure. Sometimes I read the whole thing. It, it really depends on kind of just the gut reaction and, and again, how much you, you really fall in love with the manuscript. Like I said, it's, it's kind of thing where do I believe in this enough? Do I like this enough to work for free on it for at least a couple of months, possibly longer, with no guarantee that anything is going to come out of it? Um, and however long that takes me really varies by author to author. I can speed it if I have to, right. um, but... I really prefer when I'm reading a manuscript, when I'm thinking about it for possible representation, uh, to really make sure I give it the time of day. And I read it as, as a reader first. So what will happen is if I read a book, I'm, I really try to – one of the key elements is if a manuscript makes me forget that I'm reading and I'm just like there with it, yeah. that's usually a pretty good sign. If I'm yeah. ever cognizant, okay, I am currently doing work by reading this manuscript – um, that's not the kind of connection I need to have. So it's really, it's really hard to answer that accurately because it really depends on the book itself. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. That makes sense. And well, okay. I guess this has probably changed. This is obviously only true for Writer's House, but Writer's House, it's, it's kind of a bigger name of, of agency. And it's also, you have a little bit more agents within, um, within the actual, um, agency. Do you, like how much, is there a lot of crossover between agents? Is it something that, you know, the, whoever's repping younger readers has what to do with each other? Like, what's the kind of dynamic for that? Because even as small as the book industry is, it seems like people who, who represent adult are part of the adult world. People who represent younger readers are part of the younger reader world. Or being part of an agency means that, every, that you know, everyone's talking to each other and, and 
What's going on with you guys? What's going on with you guys? Does that make sense? That became a long no, question. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, and one of the things I actually love about Writer's House is it's, it's so, as you mentioned, such like a successful agency and there are a lot of agents there, but everyone there is just absolutely wonderful. It's a really great community. Everyone's very approachable and helpful. And while it's weird, like each agent kind of is his or her own like individual little one person shop with their own list. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration. A lot of times authors will get passed. Like I'll read something. Hey, it's not quite right for me. I know an agent here who might be great for it. I'll, I'll give the manager to that person. You know, we're always kind of bouncing ideas of each other. If I ever, ever run into a problem or something I've never encountered before as an agent, there is decades and decades of experience somewhere within the community of Rogers house. Yeah. Uh, and you know, everyone kind of has their own niche here. You know, not everyone is the exact same and everyone, you know, I know this person, I, I kind of just carved the niche as like a sports and books for boys and horror novels. And just cause like, that's what I like to read. And that, that was kind of missing from Rogers house. So, um, while, Everyone is kind of their own individual person. There's just, there's such a, a fostering and, and supportive community there that I never feel like I'm out on a limb of my own, which is really nice. Yeah. So does it work that that you have total free reign to build the stuff that you're looking for? So then you find the agency that hey, like you guys don't have this, so I, this is what I can bring to the table. Or does it work the other way that um, the agency is like, okay, what have you got? No, I don't, like we don't need any more of this. Take this off your wish list. Like, do they ever interfere with what your wish list looks like, or you get to do what you what, you, what you're going to do? Yeah, I mean, every agent is pretty much free. I think this is true mostly across the board. Again, I, I, Writer's House is my one and only publishing job, so I can't speak to anything that happens outside of my beautiful little bubble. Yeah. But um, <laughs> at Writer's House, I, I'm, you know, every agent is free to take on whoever and whatever they feel would, would be the most benefit to themselves and the agency that would sell well. Right. Uh, I could definitely foresee scenarios if maybe uh, hypothetically there was an author or a personality in the current media that may be a little more controversial. Yeah. that might possibly bring negative attention to the agency if you signed that person or didn't sign that person. Uh, that might be a conversation to have. Like, hey, listen, I'm thinking about taking this person on. They have a story to tell, but there may be some blowback. That's something to think about. But in general, if it's like a good book and a good story and a good author, there's not really any kind of restriction in terms of how you can and can't represent something. In general, what are the things either that, like it's a, they're always on your list or like certain kind of stories that you're always a sucker for? Like what, what would some of those things be? Yeah, again, I'm always looking for great horror. Uh, I, I love horror. I grew up on it, like I mentioned earlier, Stephen King and my mom. And uh, I really, it's always been my, my, my first love. So I, I will never shy away from good horror, particularly uh, horror featuring like new monsters or ghost stories from different cultures. I think there are a bunch of different kind of cultures and, and ethnicities and people out there with their own legends and ghost stories and monsters that go beyond vampires and werewolves. So I'd always love to learn about a new thing to be scared of. I yeah. think that's fantastic. Uh, I'm a very big supporter of uh, military history, military memoir, uh, especially World War II right now. You know, we're at the point in our timeline where veterans of World War II, they're in their 90s and they're starting to pass away. I think right. about 500 a day right now is, is the statistic. So wow. I'd love to help preserve any kind of World War II stories that haven't been told yet, which is hard because it's already been, been told a lot of them, but any kind of new World War II, um, any kind of military memoir that, that's unique, especially featuring women in the military. Uh, I'd love to do, like, as, as women become more and more involved in the military, I'd love to do something like that. And um, I've always been very passionate. Uh, as a former uh, young boy, uh, I've always been passionate about kind of uh, increasing young male literacy, providing more content for young boys to read again. You know, I always joke that if I ever had a, a, a teenage son or a son, he's like, hey, Dad, where's a great place to go and I meet a nice girl? Uh, I'd say the young adult section at bookstores. Yep. <laughs> it's just, it's literally an entire floor of books geared towards um, females. And so uh, I think boys deserve great books as well. And uh, championing kind of young male literature is very important to me. So if you have any kind of, uh, any kind of boy centric books, I bet that's all me for sure. Yeah, so it's, it's actually interesting that you said that because I've seen stuff about, oh, getting more women into writing or things like that. But I've always felt, especially that I'm reading so much young adult, I feel like 90% of the writers that I'm reading are, are, are female writers with female protagonists. So I was like, am I, did I miss something in the, uh, unless they're talking about in, in other areas of writing that I didn't tune into, but it seems like young adult is very much dominated by, by, by women right now. Uh, it is, you know, I mean, yeah. obviously publishing industry is a business. They have to make money. Um, yeah. and just, you know, uh, statistically, you know, women, um, read more than men do, uh, across the age age group but it might be a cycle where you know women are reading more because there are more books for them and so they read them more and, and you know so again i don't know and also as as interesting and meaningful conversations are happening right now about kind of gender and gender identity and and how to best include everybody that, that's possible i think the more great stories we can have out there the better off it is for everybody right. um so you know and, and I, I every single conference i go to every time i talk to somebody 
I always hear some version of either I'm a parent uh, of young boys or I'm a teacher and I have boys in my classroom and I see what's happening to them, what's not happening to them. And I wrote this book with them in mind. So there obviously is a need for it. It's just how to best balance the industry side of publishing with, with the kind of need for it in, uh, on the shelves. Right. This is something that I saw growing up, so I don't know if it's true or if it's just my own experience, but I feel like some of the boys that I knew were readers, they went from reading, you know, kind of the middle grade and they skipped over to fantasy, like adult fantasy without, 100%. without going through the young adult section. So yes, boys tend to read up, you know, if you're a 16 yeah. year old boy, for example, um, you know, you, you tend to read uh, adult novels uh, for sure. Uh, so it's, it's like boy YA really is a, a sweet spot. It, it's out there. It exists, but it's very, very hard to do. Uh, middle grade, much less so. I think a, a fun middle grade ghost story, adventure story. And again, this isn't just because just I'm saying the word boy book doesn't mean like it's only for boys or only for girls. Right. right. I think this just right. means I think this, this, it's a cool story that, that can also appeal to boys as well. Um, and as we kind of grow up with new generations, like what exactly appeals to boys and girls is also changing. So That's kind of true. being up to speed on, on those conversations and that dynamic is also important for authors writing towards kids, knowing what, what kids are into these days because gone are the days where boys Boys are into X and girls are into Y. And there's much yeah. more crossover and common interest, which is wonderful. So finding ways to appeal to both genders um, is, is really important. Right. So all the things that you listed between the horror and things like that, that's all specifically for younger readers or do you represent for adults also? Nope. Uh, adults as well. Again, the people kind of joke is that, um, you know, it, actually the, the juvenile stuff is actually probably the, the slight minority of my list. Okay. Um, to put it all in a very simple, simple way, it's like I represent the books you give to your dad on Father's Day. Um, ah. <laughs> anything, anything you'd give to your dad on Father's Day is probably an Alex Shane book. Again, sports, biography, history, thriller, mystery, horror, uh, pop culture, pop politics, pop science, some how to, some business, stuff like that. And then again, like, you know, juvenile adventure, ghost stories, horror stories, and, and general shenanigans. Right. And, and sports is specifically nonfiction or it can be fiction also? I do fiction as well. Uh, I think sports fiction is very difficult. Yeah, uh, honestly, yes. sports nonfiction is also very difficult. You know, the intersection of sports fans and readers isn't that big. Yes. And a lot of people who are big sports readers, they're fans of a specific team. So, you know, um, uh, people who are, say, you know, Chicago Bears fans will, will read a Chicago Bears book. But if you live in Florida, you're probably not going to like the Bears as much. So it's very <laughs> hard to find those kind of big story, big sports books. Um, so a lot of the sports fiction, I, or sports nonfiction, I do, excuse me, is a little more regional or have kind of a national conversation surrounding them. Oh, so that's, if it's regional, does that mean that you're working with either a small publisher or a much smaller market then? Because, I mean, yeah, I don't I mean, know how depends. big it is. So for example, uh, I, in 2016, for example, when the, uh, my beloved New England Patriots won the Super Bowl yeah. uh, over the Atlanta Falcons, um, that was such an amazing uh, season, but also an amazing year. Like 2016 was an absolutely wild year in, in American culture, history, politics, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. There was the deflate gates. If you're familiar, there was, a, there was Tom Brady with his deflate gate suspension. <laughs> it, was 2006, yeah. it, was, it was 2016. It was the 2016 election was going on. And there was yeah. the whole kind of like all that was happening. Yeah. And then there was the Atlanta Falcons big comeback. And so that was such like, that was a much bigger story than just one particular team's right. sports season. Right. So I was able to sell that to St. Martin's. That's much, which is a big publisher. Wow, yeah. However, I've also done some kind of smaller, more regional that are with the kind of University of New England Press or, um, you know, Triumph books or some stuff like that. So it really depends on whether the, the sport itself is the focus of the not, or the, the book or if there's like a bigger kind of, connection to it in the american cultural space right so if we can find a story of an athlete who becomes a soldier then then we're sold that we got you as an <laughs> agent <laughs> yeah another great example is uh, uh it'll it'll be out by the time uh this podcast airs most likely i'm not sure but on march 2nd uh i have a a, a middle grade nonfiction. it's the biography of glenn burke uh, oh. comes out with philomel he was the first ever openly gay athlete across any of the four major sports he played for the los angeles dodgers the high five yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. Yes, the high, invented the high five. Yes, invented the high five as well. First guy ever to create with the high five. So that's a great example of kind of the intersection of like social justice or history and culture and sports that I'm really proud of. So something like that would be fantastic for me. Just as a side thing, when, when um, Frank DeFord came out with his autobiography, he kind of puts in like as a comment there that a lot of people don't necessarily uh, like see sports writing as like actual writing. So I mean, he's someone who's an incredibly lyrical writer. But he was kind of saying that, like, when, when awards go out for writers, they don't necessarily look at sports writers or actually writers. Do you see anything like that, if that's true, that when people are writing sports um, nonfiction, the kind of larger world sees it as, like, oh, that's its own thing? 
or, or what? Did you see that, like, no, writers, all writers kind of respect each other, and, like, it doesn't matter what you're writing about? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think sports writing will I, will, I will put sports writing with every category. I think there are some absolutely wonderfully talented sports writers who do amazing work and really delve in deeply into the, the conflicts surrounding it and the various elements of, of sports and, and life. And there's some absolute hacks out there who just churn out crap. Right. Um, you know, that, that goes for music, that goes for fiction, nonfiction. I think there's there's good and bad writers across every every field. Um, and, you know, if, if one thing I like about, you know, respect is it's usually earned, not just granted. And so uh, I will say, I think in general, it can be harder for sports writers to break out because sports is such a specific entity. Yeah. Uh, and it's very easy to kind of ignore sports versus like politics or news. Right. But uh, I think sports writers are fantastic and do some great work. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you don't necessarily see them listed for for prizes and stuff like that, but maybe this, if, maybe just for sports uh, prizes, then <laughs> yeah. But so what? There's a lot of people who don't get the awards. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Well, I think I can go on and on, but I, we got to wrap up just to keep the time under things. So um, we always wrap up with our with our fill in the blank of I love it when writers, editor, editors, agents, you know, publishers, books do X, and I really don't like it when they do X. How would you fill in the blank for those? All right, well, you know, I, I really love it. I think I, I might have already said this, and I'm going to reiterate it here because it's just very true. I love it when uh, a book makes me forget what I do for a living. Yeah, uh, I think that is always the key. Whenever I'm aware that I'm reading as an agent versus I'm just reading because I'm engrossed in this story in some capacity, it's just a wonderfully cool feeling. Uh, it's just really, really enjoyable. Um, and to the flip side, I, I hate it when authors – I hate it when authors in general – um, write something because they feel like they should uh, and not because they want to. Uh, I think that happens, unfortunately, more often than, than it, it, I'd like it to. Um, yeah. if, you're not, if you're not in love with your story, odds are I won't be either. And so don't write ever because you feel like you have to write this book. Feel like you want to write this book and you need to write this book. Amazing. Amen. That's also going to go. That's going to be our other magnet that we make from this. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Well, Al, thank you so much for joining us. This has been, It's been such a pleasure to talk with you. Oh, well, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This was a bonus episode of Oh My Work podcast featuring agent Alec Shane. To find out more about Alec and whatever he's up to, look at the link in the episode notes. To keep track of Oh My Work podcast and all the great stuff we're up to, check us out on Instagram at Oh My Work podcast. Go to eltenabound.com. Subscribe like, tell all your people about it. Thanks so much for joining us. Catch you next time.